afternoon, everyone. Welcome to All Aboard, the Future of Federal Passenger Rail Funding. My name is Alicia, and I am here with the T4 America team. And today, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a bit of logistics before I pass it on to our presenters. Uh, today, we will be taking questions via the chat box, and that's in front of your computer on the left-hand side of your screen. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them there. Uh, if you need audio, it will come through your computer, so make sure that you're able to hear that. And at the end of the presentation, we will have the recorded presentation with PowerPoint for you to view if for some reason you um, are not able to view it through your computer. That being said, I am going to go ahead and pass it on to John Robert. He is our T4 America Chair and also Senior Advisor. John Robert? Good. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you all for joining us on the call this afternoon. I'm John Robert Smith, and some of you may know me better from my time as chairman of the board of Amtrak and from my service as the mayor of Meridian, Mississippi, so you know where my heart is and my uh, political will is when it comes to transportation. It's certainly about seeing the passenger rail as an important part of the transportation choices that are being demanded more and more um, by the people of this country, especially our uh, aging boomers and our emerging uh, millennials. Uh, I do now chair Transportation for America, where I've been in D.C. for the past um, almost eight years now. And those of you who may not be familiar with Transportation for America, we're a national alliance of local leaders, and those leaders can be elected or can be business or chamber, but they've really come together to see that we're focusing on locally driven transportation solutions, not only that our local leaders have a seat at the table, that their voice is heard, but that the dollars flow from the federal and state level into the hands of those who, I think, make the best choices because they're closest to their constituency. Uh, some of you are members, and some of you we would like to be members in the future, and you may remember that our executive director, James Corliss, um, has moved with his family back to his native California, where he will lead the Sacramento Council of Government. And I'm pleased to be joined this afternoon by T4A's new executive director, Adria Turner, who comes to us most recently from the D.C. Department of Transportation, where she served as Chief of Staff, and Adria also has experience not only at the local level, but in state government, uh, especially working with the Department of Transportation for the state of Maryland. Adria, thank you for joining us this afternoon. John Robert, it's great to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, you know, coming from a rural state myself, I'm very interested in, um, in continuing to support passenger rail and know how important it is to our transportation network. So I'm happy to be here with you. Well, thank you for making, uh, continuing to make uh, passenger rail an important part of the suite of transportation interests that, that drive the work we do. And um, this afternoon you will also hear from my good friend Knox Ross, the mayor of Peelahatchee, Mississippi. He is also has served for a number of years on the executive committee of the Southern um, Rail Commission. And we'll hear from Knox in, in just a few minutes. Um, but I want to talk about um, how we need to position ourselves uh, in support of passenger rail. Uh, you know, over the years I've noticed so often we who believe in passenger rail have been only reactive. Um, so I am hoping that we began with the FAST Act certainly being very proactive on the, from the authorization standpoint uh, and that we are ahead of the uh, advocacy game. We're not coming to it from a reactive style. We're much uh, prepared to be proactive. So what is at stake for rail? Well, as you know we have been very successful uh, in the authorization process at Capitol Hill, and I'll touch on a few of those successes in just a moment. And you have 
no funding, obviously, from the federal government unless it's authorized. So we've done that hard work, and many of you joined us in that work, and we thank you for that. Certainly, we, we all had to be unified together. But now we've moved to the appropriation size, side. It doesn't matter to what level you're authorized. Now you have to appropriate dollars to those authorizations, and that's where the pinch has come. Uh, if you saw the administration's budget that was released, besides reducing all transportation funding some 13 percent, and, and that's the transportation funding that's not protected by the trust fund. So that hits both transit very hard, and it, it honestly hits highways hard as well. Uh, the budget also proposes uh, zeroing out the very, very successful and popular Tiger Grant program. But let's talk today about what it does to passenger rail. And you have before you a comment taken, quoted from the administration's budget, and what you see very clearly is it's zeroing out any operational funding for the long-distance uh, passenger rail service uh, in this country. Uh, it also presses for a greater, fuller cost allocation to state-supported trains, and it does maintain funding to the very important North Northeast Corridor. And to remind us all, Congress created Amtrak because of its desire to save and sustain the long distance system. At the time of the creation of Amtrak, there was no Northeast Carter and, and really uh, no state supported trains. So it was all about preserving this national network of transportation, um, no one of which is successful without the other two legs of the system. So the administration's budget would zero out funding for the long distance system, which impacts. Um, the train certainly through our states in the south, but also through Pennsylvania and um, uh, certainly through California and Colorado and um, other states that have joined us on the call this afternoon or who aspire to a more robust uh, passenger rail system like Indiana does and Wisconsin does and Michigan does. Um, so what are uh, if you look at the administration's budget, it restructures uh, Amtrak's funding uh, streams, it terminates service uh, funding for the long distance service, and does maintain the Northeast Carter. But if we look at possible scenarios, uh, certainly one is the administration's budget is adopted by Congress. So that means the end of the long distance uh, passenger rail network. Of uh, what we hear and have heard. Um, from Republican leadership uh, as well as the other side of the aisle that, that the administration's budget isn't going anywhere on Capitol Hill. And we hear comments um, depending on where the senator or congressman is far from as to which part of the program uh, transportation uh, budget they want to uh, uh, protect. Uh, that's good news for us. but. That only comes about when members of Congress are hearing the local stories of impact that all of you can tell to your members of Congress. Um, the, another scenario is that Congress pursues even deeper cuts because of sequestration driving um, future cuts. I, I think while we have to be on guard for, for uh, congressional deeper cuts, I think that is less likely and then the, the desired scenario is that we actually appropriate um, funds to maintain the FAST Act authorized levels. And you may be aware that the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in the House have uh, unanimously asked the House appropriators to fully fund the FAST Act at the authorized levels. We're hearing the same thing from members of uh, the Senate who's uh, authorized um, uh, jurisdiction is over several different committees, not one. But, but what do we have to lose if we have one of the two uh, negative scenarios, that being the administration's budget passes or Congress takes deeper cuts? Well, what do you have on your screen 
before you now is the USBOT's authorized levels in FY15, and then you see the results of the work of that all of you have engaged in on the authorized uh, side of this equation in the FAST Act, looking at FY16 through FY20. And of course, there was the creation of some additional programs that have a very positive impact to those of you working to expand um, uh, and improve your passenger rail service and make it Safer. So let's take a look at just FY18, which is bracketed there in the red. Our next slide will um, move to FY18, and here's where we we talk about funding and um, uh, specifically. And I'll move from the bottom of that chart up um, with the. Uh, Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair, 175 million, Amtrak Northeast Carter, 515 million, Amtrak National Network, um, 1.1 billion. And then there are two um, new programs that were authorized one um, called REG for 20 million, and one called CRISI for 231 million. And if we move to uh, look at Chrissy in depth. That's the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Program. It's not new, but it's new in the way it's applied. A number of rail safety and infrastructure programs were were, were rolled together under one um, uh, authorized funding stream, the acronym Chrissy, uh, because it did consolidate these programs. And there is a rural set aside, which is important for the long distance system and the national network, since many of those states serve to have um, few transportation choices. So a 25% set aside. There is a federal match of 80% for Chrissy, and it is open to many um, to apply, whether you're a state or an interstate compact or public authorities, local governments, and track, um, and others, including short line railroads, can apply. Um, and it can be used for a number of things uh, safety technology, which includes PTC, which we know is a big expense um, for uh, all rail, freight, and, and passenger. Uh, also, uh, various capital projects, grade crossing issues, uh, relocation, realignments, and improvements. Uh, again, short line capital projects, and then planning as well. So it has many, many uses, and we think it's a very flexible program. Uh, we were heavily engaged with a number of you in, in working with uh, our Hill partners in crafting this language and seeing it through, but we would certainly hate to lose uh, appropriated funds to uh, the Christie program and think that those of you looking for, to your uh, passenger rail in your region, this is certainly something you would be uh, uh, would want to ap apply for and compete for, and uh, please see the large uh, federal match. Then there is the Restoration and Enhancement Grants, RIG, and it supports the operation of new restored or enhanced inner city passenger rail. So um, for those along the Gulf, for example, that want to restore their service east of New Orleans to Florida, or for those in the northern tier of states that would want to see the Pioneer restored. Um, yeah, I can certainly see uh, REG as an important asset. There may be new services uh, for one, uh, looking at connecting uh, the Crescent, which splits in my hometown of Meridian, Mississippi, and runs between New York and New Orleans, connecting the Crescent over to Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, that would be a new service. A number of your states have new service you're considering. And then also enhancing, that could be um, uh, increasing the frequency, for example, on an existing line um, through your state or your region. And it allows for six such lines to receive uh, operating support for three years, and it would be a tiered structure proposed 
uh, on, and authorize 80% of your operating costs for the first year, 60% in year two, and 40% in year three. And this is designed to give these new or enhanced or restored service a glide path to build name recognition, promotion, ridership, um, to tweak the schedule for frequency and on-time performance. So it gives you uh, a competitive glide path, not unlike state-supported service today was initially federally supported. There has been a glide path over a number of years to move to uh, self-sufficiency, and the reg get, would give up to six new lines uh, the opportunity for that same glide path and operating support. So we think for many of the, you, this is, is a, uh, a really big and, and a really important opportunity that you would want to uh, proactively uh, work with your members of Congress to sustain. Now I want to talk about the grassroots of it. I was told this morning that the administration specifically in making choices about cuts, if it was something they were not familiar with, had not heard of, it was recommended to be cut. And this morning, a, a partner uh, that works with us closely and has good ties to both the Hill and to the White House said that the message has to be a grassroots message driven upward to the administration to hear and understand the importance of uh, the long distance system and passenger rail in general to the economic development and uh, growth plans for your cities, towns, and regions. And obviously those that were supportive in the last election have a greater uh, voice. So, one of those voices, um, Knox Ross, Mayor P. Lahatchie, a longtime member of the Southern Rail Commission and has watched that commission grow um, to what I think is um, one of the most effective voices in Washington on uh, the future of passenger rail, um, along with NARP and many of you on the call, um, uh, Knox and the Southern Rail Commission have really leveraged the grassroots support in a remarkable way in the three states of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and on into Florida, and uh, is growing that reach now into Texas and to Georgia as well. So Knox, um, why don't you take a minute and talk about the Southern Rail Commission's efforts, successes. I'd like to know what you're hearing on Capitol Hill from the appropriators that you've been in conversation with. And on your screen, those of you joining the call, is um, you will not click that link to see a three-minute video, but understand when this is sent out to you, you'll be able to click that link, see a three-minute video from the Gulf Coast inspection train. Not? Thank you, John Robert. And, and uh, I would encourage you to click that link when we get through with the call because it will inspire you. Uh, you'll see a cross-section of America that turned out to say we want passenger service restored to the Gulf Coast. And it's a, it's a cross-section of all demographics, all races, all backgrounds, all parties, and they're all standing together in a single purpose. And it, it, uh, it, it really, if, if you are a person who believes in passenger rail service in this country, it will do you a lot of good to watch it, and you'll get a lot of good ideas on what to do in your own areas. But the Southern Rail Commission is a three-state compact made up of Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. It was formed by the United States Congress back in the 1980s, really initially to uh, promote high-speed passenger rail service. And, and it operated like that for many years, but uh, as we discovered that the, the uh, population densities really aren't conducive to high-speed rail in the deep south, but we, we did find that passenger rail was very important, especially to our rural communities. And so we are all appointed by our respective governors. There are uh, six commissioners from each state, and we meet quarterly uh, in, our three, uh, in our three states. And it has become a very important uh, vehicle for our governors to give an example, at our last meeting in Baton Rouge, the governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, joined us. 
uh, spoke with us for a few minutes. Uh, he has become a very integral part of, uh, of the commission, in fact, appointing uh, the present pro tem of the Louisiana House the uh, Transportation Secretary of Louisiana and also the Intermodal Secretary of Louisiana are all members of our commission. And in Mississippi, we have business leaders, including the head of the Mississippi Economic Council, among others, that, uh, and, the member, and the head of the Gulf Coast Business Council, appointed by our governor, that I think demonstrates the importance that those governors put on, on passenger rail in our states. And I know it is unusual to have uh, a commission coming from three mostly red states that's not seen as passenger rail friendly. But uh, our governor, who bills himself as the nation's first Tea Party governor, sees the benefit of passenger rail because he sees that our state, in the challenges that it faces in Mississippi, must connect itself to the rest of the country and must find ways to bring people to our cities, especially to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, to, for economic purposes. And as we lose air service, as it becomes harder to move around the country, we have to find ways to do that. And he, is, he understands and has identified that, that passenger rail is an integral part of what we do. Uh, as we went through that, he instructed us to go out and work on this. And interestingly enough, Mississippi also has two senators, and Senator Roger Wicker and Senator Thad Cochran. Senator Thad Cochran uh, chairs the, House, the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, Senator Wicker is a leader on the Senate Commerce Committee, and both believe in intermodal transportation, and both are big, big supporters of what we're trying to do, and have and our relationships with them have been critical in making this happen. And again, I'll emphasize that these are all Republican elected officials from a very red state, a very conservative state, who all recognize the value of passenger rail. And I think it's important to remember that this isn't a one-party issue that we have found as we work with our friends in Washington, D.C., that we have cultivated many Republican senators and congressmen and women who have long-distance trains that run through their communities, and their communities have worked on them and told them of the value of it, and they begin to refer to these trains as their trains. I heard a senator when I testified before the Senate Commerce Committee from Montana who referred to his train as my train and my station, and that is a sea change, really, I think, uh, in, in Washington and is very encouraging to us as we move forward. But we, we, work, we have been working, one of our principal uh, goals is to restore service that was, that was suspended after Katrina from New Orleans to Orlando, Florida. Prior to Katrina, it was a three-day-a-week service. It was uh, unreliable, and uh, it, it was just not that popular. But, however, the cities along that route saw the benefit and the need for a daily service. And what we found was that we had a grassroots effort that was really, uh, really truly grassroots. It was calling the governor, calling uh, our senators, saying we want this back. And so they approached our commission and asked us to begin work on that. And we then looked at who would be our best partner in trying to move forward our commission and make it effective. And our long relationship with John Robert Smith, he's been a longtime friend of mine in the mayor business, and he was a former chairman of the Southern Rail Commission. We, we brought in Transportation for America and their partner, Smart Growth America, and also a, a, the Center for Planning Excellence in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And they put together a strategy for us, in, both in Washington and throughout the route, to not only uh, Transportation for America has been an indispensable partner to us to craft our message to get us in touch with the committees we needed to meet with, with the uh, Commerce Committee and the Appropriations Committee and the key senators and representatives that we may not have had relationships with outside of our own folks and putting together the strategies we needed there. Uh, the Center for Planning Excellence put together our marketing strategies, our social media strategies, uh, our communication strategies with uh, the, the mayors, and business leaders and the uh, convention visitors boards all along the line to begin to, to tell our message and to tell them what we needed them to do. And we, we have met with everyone from New Orleans to uh, Jacksonville. We started this effort by a grassroots effort. We would go take speaking engagements, uh, really keying off the 10-year Katrina anniversary and using that as sort of our start 
and being able to go to a lot of those commemorative meetings and talking about and building support. Then Amtrak, who has been a great partner and is really a new day there with their new leadership, uh, they look at, at, at uh, long-distance passenger rail as a growth opportunity. They are looking at, they're very supportive of trying to restore the service as Mr. Mormon has come out with publicly and openly supporting it. They're looking at other opportunities around the country to be able to enhance the long-distance passenger rail network. So I think that's a new, a, a new day and something we all need to take advantage of. Out of that, we, we were able to put together something called the Gulf Coast Working Group through our relationships with our senators, Cochran and Wicker, through our relationship with Transportation for America. We were able to put that in the FAST Act that put together a funding stream of a million dollars for us to uh, put together a plan of action to be presented to the Senate Commerce Committee of what it will take to restore service to seven day a week and what it will cost to do that. We are about next month to, to issue that report. Uh, that was under the leadership of the Federal Railroad Administration and former Administrator Sarah Feinberg, who through that we were able to maintain and, and develop a fantastic relationship with the Federal Railroad Administration and they have just all been inst in instrumental in pushing this along. We, uh, we have gone with Amtrak across the panhandle of Florida into Louisiana and Mississippi to meet with community leaders. We're about to do that again on the week of April the 10th. And we have brought along Senator Nelson from Florida, who is the uh, ranking member on commerce, through the efforts in Live Oak, Florida, and other places they have brought him along. Uh, just purely grassroots efforts to bring people to the table that we would not normally have. But I, I think that what we have found and what is the most effective part to push this along are the local people. Uh, we've been able to put together a strategy to communicate all this and sort of be the, the middleman, so to speak, between the local communities and, and our leadership in Washington, leadership with the Host Railroad, to help them to understand that this is real that people want it, that the business community wants it, that the government leaders want it, and the individual folks want it. And we've been able to do that very effectively uh, with the help of T4A, CPEX, and our relationships on the ground there. And going forward, we'll continue to work to get that done. We feel very good about our prospects of getting that done because we have been able to get people to effectively tell their story through our own social media, through our websites, and through our partners and through just individual mayors and governors and congressmen uh, telling their story to uh, our senators and to Amtrak. Where we are now, uh, I think, as far as funding goes, is that uh, I've had a chance to meet with uh, staff in the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, they are very uh, confident that they believe they will be able to fund Rig and Chrissy both, I think, is critical not only for our train but for other projects around the country. I think when you look at this video, and I would encourage you to go to our website, southernrailcommission.org, that gives a lot more detail on what we've been about being done over the last couple of years. I think you can just insert whatever the states that you're in. If you're trying to do the Pioneer, if you're trying to do something in the Northeast, uh, the New York Southern Tier or wherever, I think you can just plug in your communities into the same, the, the same uh, program that we've been running, and it works just as well. And, and it's something that you can use as a model for what you're trying to do. But the Appropriations Committee is very, is very hopeful they'll be able to get that done. I know we're in, a, we're in a, a time right now that things are very uncertain, and I think it, it's, it's imperative to all of us to communicate to our elected officials that Amtrak's important. It's important economically to us. Uh, it's important to our communities. Uh, all across the country, especially the small communities in the rural parts of this country, like the places I am from, that we have to have and maintain connection. We have to maintain connection with the rest of the country for us to survive and thrive as communities. But the main thing I would encourage you to do and, and to remember is that passenger rail is not a one-party uh, uh, priority. You have very powerful Republicans in Congress who are very interested and very supportive of passenger rail, and I would encourage you to cultivate them and to talk to them. Uh, with them, it is more an economic uh, uh, way of doing things. They look at the economic benefits. They look at uh, the individual cities that have this. They look at it in connecting 
colleges and universities. I, I think an example uh, of, of what we've seen is in Louisiana. Uh, we're looking at, at restoring service on the I-20 corridor, and one of the cities we would restore that to is Ruston, Louisiana. And Ruston, Louisiana is, is a city that is very progressive and is home for Louisiana Tech University. And, and the president of Louisiana Tech, Dr. Les Geis, is one of our loudest supporters because he sees the future of his university lies west in Texas and the students he can provide that he can, and he needs a direct connection to Texas. And he sees the Amtrak service as the lifeline for his university and the growth and prosperity of it. And we see all those different things. So I'd also encourage you to look at all the different partners, just past the mayors and past the people, but the universities, the uh, large employers that need to bring people back and forth, the uh, military bases that have to get people back and forth. There's so many different uh, uh, groups and people that can be your supporters and be the people, and you're going to need them. because we're gonna, It's a new day. It's a new day for Amtrak. It's a new day for us. But it's also as pastoral supporters, we have to find ways to help market these services better, to encourage people to use it, to make it uh, viable for its, uh, for its users, and also for, for the people that fund it. They have to be able to defend it, and we have to find ways to do that as well. But the SRC, I think, has been an, an excellent vehicle through which to support uh, the rest restoration service across the uh, Gulf Coast. And I think we, you can follow our example especially in an area that may not be seen as friendly to passenger rail, uh, as, as a great example of how it can be done in other parts of the country as well. Great. Thank you, Knox. I appreciate that. Um, and there are going to be a couple of questions coming your way in a minute. You know, Knox mentioned we're in uncertain times, and the way you take those uncertain times and make them certain is by raising uh, your voice and making your story very real. You know, the, the budget has been couched that it would, it's about addressing the national debt, but if you truly look at the budget, it has very little impact on the national debt. And when you talk about um, killing the long distance system, you save at the most uh, $200 million, and that doesn't even take into account those who use the national system that then interconnect with state-supported trains and the Northeast Corridor, so your savings um, will be even less than that. And when you, if the national system, the long-distance trains, aren't a part of sharing all of the back-of-house costs, uh, the administration of Amtrak, the legal department of Amtrak, um, uh, the uh, ticketing and the reservation system, then if long distance trains, which now are allocated part of that cost, if they're not there to absorb part of that cost, then it's going to fall more and more on the state supported trains and the Northeast Carter. So you don't get a financial benefit by uh, killing off the long distance system. And when you couple the cessation of long distance trains with the potential for loss of all of central air service, which is also recommended to be fully cut by the administration's budget, then you look at many of our states, um, our citizens would be left only with highways as a way to move within their state, within their region, and, and through this country. That is not an option for our uh, senior population for many that um, struggle with the meeting their everyday needs of life. Um, that, and it will lead to the depopulation, depopulation of rural America. When, when the economic development sees that you have no transportation alternatives, they simply make those investments elsewhere. So I think, how do you get involved? You begin to um, make your story one, I believe, about economic development, um, connectivity of your people, uh, vitality, uh, ensuring the vitality of your region. Um, you look at what happens to local communities who are served by passenger rail and who, take, who really take advantage of it to connect their own communities, transit services, whatever they may be, to the larger region and leverage your voice. You all have clients. You may have most suppliers to the rail industry. There may be manufacturers 
um, that are a part of serving uh, passenger rail in your state. Um, Amtrak can supply you or we can supply you with a sheet for every state as to the impact of passenger rail, uh, Amtrak in this case, uh, within your state. Uh, I think you need to be armed with that. Uh, certainly get involved. Uh, obviously, I'm going to recommend Transportation for America. We need your involvement and your voice, but also uh, the National Association of Railroad Passengers that I believe is on this call, the other um, national associations that you may be a member of, whether that's if you're a local elected official, whether that's the National League of Cities of the U.S. Conference of Mayors of the National Association of, of the Counties, um, there, uh, the AMPO for, for the planners, there are any number that this should, that passenger rail should be a factor in uh, their ad advocacy. Yeah, so leverage your voice there. If they're not speaking to the importance of passenger rail, then they need to be. And we certainly look forward to working um, with all of those as we move forward. Now, what do you do? You, you call your members of Congress. We have a set of talking points that we'll be glad to deliver to each of you if you will contact us so we can send them out to those who signed in on the call, uh, suggested talking points. Um, and Knox, I'm going to come to you in a minute with uh, messages, specific messages that you think move members of Congress. But uh, it needs to be a coordinated effort, and I would ask you to please let us at Transportation for America know if you have called a member of Congress or their staff in the district or uh, in the Capitol, um, what response did you get? If you send a letter to a member of Congress, um, would you please send us a copy of it as well? It helps us when we go to visit your member of Congress to know that you have already made that touch and um, uh, have that in-state connection to them. Uh, if you'd like uh, additional resources, and there was a question already from the call of should you have a, a town hall meeting with your member of Congress when they're in the district, by all means. Um, and uh, we can help supply you with resources for those in-district meetings. Certainly when you come to D.C., and many of you will make a trip um, to Washington to tell your local or regional story, we'd be happy to meet with you before you go to the Hill to give you the latest um, uh, talking points or issues facing passenger rail before you go, and many of you will come this spring. Um, timing is absolutely key, and what many of us uh, that are advocating for our calls make the mistake of uh, we insert our voice when it hits the floor of the uh, U.S. House or Senate. Well, it's too late by the, that time. It's basically um, uh, done uh, this when it, as we've observed just recently with health care, the votes are decided for whatever hits the floor. So you want your voice um, at the committee level as committees begin to work um, appropriations as they begin to work the articulation of an infrastructure package, if there is one, you want your voice there uh, at committee level, if not before. That's when you begin to influence members' minds, uh, and you want them to be your strong advocate going into the meeting um, rather than let them get too far out on a limb that they can't get back. Um, the first week of April is an important date because that's when members' funding requests are due. So you need to make sure that your members of Congress are aware that you want um, full funding under the FAST Act for our passenger rail as we have described it, and we can give you additional information there. Certainly we would welcome you becoming a member of Transportation um, for America. Uh, if you are a T4A member already, um, you automatically by uh, your membership get 30 minutes with our staff experts 
to get specific information on your region and on um, even specific projects. I know some of you have taken advantage of that with Tiger. Uh, if you're a member of T4, you immediately get uh, uh, an hour's worth of time with Beth Osborne, who is the former um, Assistant Secretary for Policy at the USD un USDOT under Secretary Ray LaHood. She was part of crafting the Tiger program and managed the first five or six rounds of the Tiger program. So there are advantages to being a part of our network. Um, I will um, uh, now turn to questions that we have received. Um, one of the questions, Knox, is specific messages. Uh, the message of, I love my train, don't take my train, doesn't get you very far. Um, no. What specific messages do you find resonate? And I know you've talked not only to members from your state of Mississippi, uh, which is easier for you, but you've talked to staff that are representing other states, including states in the Northeast corridor. So what, is the mess what are the messages you found that resonate? Well, it's a connection message. Uh, I mean, that you've told very well in this call that 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 you you have to have transportation options, not only for millennials but for older Americans who uh, you don't don't like to drive as much. Uh, but but with a lot of the members I talk to, it's more of an economic development uh, message. It's a message that all forms of transportation subsidized. I mean, unfortunately, Amtrak's were the only one that has a line item. I mean, the rest of every other form of transportation is kind of buried somewhere in the total transportation and general fund budget of, of both the federal and state governments. But it's just telling the a, a, a economic development uh, message. And, and if you watch that video that's included in the presentation, what you'll hear from Governor Bryant of Mississippi and, Go and Senator Wicker of Mississippi in speech after speech is that they look at that train as – an economic development tool to bring people to the Mississippi coast in that example to spend money. I mean, Governor Bryant makes this classic comment, bringing people in from all over the country to spend a day, a week, or a month or two and spend and bring their money with them. And, and I think that that's telling in that in, in a political circle, uh, politicians, and I'm one so I can speak to this, uh, always want to be able to say that they were able to bring business and bring economic opportunity to a region. And I think that sells better than anything else. Uh, the education part of it also is very, very uh, uh, effective. Uh, that part of it where the colleges along lines see the impact of having rail service in their student populations and their ability to recruit uh, the top students and those and the presidents of those universities usually are very politically uh, active and, and politically influential and I would recruit them heavily to, uh, to help you send your message because they usually have a special relationship with, with uh, not only state but federal officials as well. Good. Thank you, Knox. Uh, uh, another question came in that I, I will direct to you, and it's from another region of the country knows how they can connect to the Southern Rail Commission and um, would it be possible to have one of you come and help them build the kind of capacity that's been created along the Gulf? Yeah, uh, you can you can contact us through our website, uh, and we we will do that. I went up myself and to Cincinnati, I don't know, three or four months ago, and met with uh, a group uh, led by All Aboard Ohio and and by Amtrak, looking at a way to uh, to expand the Cardinal to daily service. And that, from that meeting, which was a meeting of folks from West Virginia and Ohio, principally, and some of the other, and Indiana, uh, that they have uh, passed legislation in the West Virginia House to form a commission to uh, move forward with studies and, 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 and direct support of that. And also there's support in Ohio as well. Uh, that was very effective. Yes, I mean, we're willing to come help uh, as we can. I mean, we are a limited organization. Uh, we're funded by our three states, uh, you know, by our three states' departments of transportation, just for our expenses. 
but uh, but yes, we were happy to do that and have done it. I, and I also wanted to. I was writing down some notes here for for you all to look at some examples of of local grassroots efforts that have worked. Uh, speaking of the Cardinal, uh, Oxford, Ohio, uh, has and and the Miami of Ohio University have been putting money into and have put several hundred thousand dollars into securing building a platform and securing a stop for the Cardinal at their campus. They see the benefit of that. Uh, Arcadia Valley, Missouri on the uh, Texas Eagle is another grassroots effort to get a stop, to find the funding, to get a platform. I would also encourage you to look at the TEMPO organization, T-E-M-P-O. Uh, it's, uh, that is an organization that supports the Texas Eagle. I had a chance to go to their meeting in San Antonio recently. Uh, they do some very creative things to support that train, very much local marketing uh, for the different cities. Uh, very well done. They have a website. You can Google that. Uh, and also on our, our uh, efforts, one of the efforts is for, for, from a town called Live Oak, Florida that has never had a stop. They just want to stop. They had over 1,000 people out greeting the inspection train when it came through. They have developed a big social media presence. They really are responsible, one of the main people responsible for bringing Senator Bill Nelson of Florida uh, into very much supporting our efforts. Uh, I would encourage you just to do a little Google search of them and just take a look at what they're doing. Uh, very effective, very, very effective grassroots social media uh, campaign by Live Oak. Very little money spent on that. Good. Thank you, Knox. I'm going to try to go through some of the other questions very quickly so we can get through them um, within our appointed time. One question came in. Uh, it's a statement that Amtrak currently recovers 94% of its operating cost. If long distance passenger rail vanishes, what percent recovery would be projected? Perhaps that's an argument for more long distance trains, not less. Uh, to answer, to address your question, the 94% recovery I think also includes all of Amtrak's assets, so it includes the properties they own, uh, other things besides um, just the operation of the trains, but that's, that's a much higher return than if you fully allocated cost to the highway system or the aviation system, and I'll try, tie in another uh, statement that was made uh, and the person was absolutely right, and you'd be shocked at how many members of Congress have never thought about how much um, we, the people of the United States, invest in supporting the um, aviation system and the airlines of this country. Uh, we provide the air traffic controllers, the TSA agents, the airports, the runways, all of those things. Um, I had a congressman tell me that he wanted Amtrak treated like an airline, and I said, I'll take that deal, um, because we do supply all of those things for the aviation industry, because we decided that was a national asset, and we had to have it. Um, we certainly, the, the trust fund does not fully cover the highways. Uh, the general fund uh, is every year covering the uh, deficit uh, of need to uh, the Highway Trust Fund, and we're, we're still not addressing all the capital needs there. So that's a, a, a very real point that we need to be clear in helping our public and members of Congress understand how passenger rail is funded. Um, the, back to the question about more long-distance trains, um, what, splitting the Crescent and Meridian and running the overnight section of Dallas-Fort Worth, Amtrak has found would actually be uh, an operational neutral uh, service. It wouldn't need additional operating support. Certainly, we ought to be looking at, and I agree with you 100%, growing the long-distance system. You never cut your way to a, a good, viable system. Grow that system. Make those connections first that clearly makes sense and do not um, uh, overburden on operating costs. Um, so I think that question was well uh, posed and uh, we certainly agree with you here. Um, uh, Amtrak has sponsored a national rail day. Um, uh, there was certainly one last year. They've been very successful. Amtrak doesn't have a presence at every, in every state. 
um, that it serves every year. They tend to rotate that. Um, but you're right, that builds a strong base of support for people to learn more about passenger rail. We have a question, and uh, Rachel DeResto with the Center for Planning Excellence is one of our uh, call-ins today. And Rachel, this question is, how do we get assistance from CPEX? So we will connect you with the participant on the call that asked that question so you can have direct conversation um, uh, there. We've talked about the uh, connection with air service. Um, names of GOP supporters uh, that are important. So yes, obviously Senator Thad Cochran, senior senator from Mississippi who chairs appropriations is key. Um, uh, in, the, in that appropriations process. Uh, also, Senator Shelby uh, on appropriations uh, is, is key there. Um, we can send you a list of appropriators on both the House and Senate side, um, and uh, we can marry that with the rail service in their district. Um, because we want to target, it's, timing is important and the message is important, but you also need to make sure you're talking to someone who's actually got a vote at that particular time. So members uh, that sit on committees of jurisdiction are that first target, and uh, we can get those out uh, to you. Um, I believe that is the end of the the question, I believe we've addressed most of those questions, and uh, you will see that there, for additional questions that come in, or uh, if you feel we didn't fully answer one of yours, please reach out uh, to Renata Reeder, who is here with us at Transportation for America. You see her email address there, and um, we will be Alicia, tell me how we have the contact for the individuals who are, do we have that so we can? Yes, yeah, so everyone that has registered will be getting a thank you email, and in that email we will include the link to the video that you guys weren't able to see earlier. Uh, we will add, uh, again, the contact information for Renata Reader, our out uh, outreach director here, if you have any additional questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll head and allocate the questions to our policy experts. And then after that, we're also going to be including our talking points and letter uh, that we have been circulating. Very good. And, and they will get um, a copy of the slide. That is correct. And the, the audio presentation as well. Very good. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of you for joining. I want you to think of your states as parts of a connected region. and. It's really how, and, and I looked at where our callers came from, they're from all across our country, and it's only when we link those regions and tell those combined stories of economic development and opportunity and service to our people, whether you're in the coastal south or the far northeast in Maine or Vermont or in the great northern tier of states of Montana and the Dakotas and Idaho, uh, or certainly of uh, moving down the western shore of our country and then back across that great middle part of our country that has too long um, been left out of the equation for the national system um, and uh, struggles to maintain the service that you have. We want to be partners with you uh, to maximize this regional voice into a national voice and uh, we look forward to hearing from you, and when you're in D.C., um, please take the opportunity to let us know and visit with us. Uh, we'll make ourselves available for you and help any way we can in connecting you in a better way with a better, stronger message to your member of Congress. On behalf of uh, uh, Adria Turner, uh, here our new executive director, and the team here at Trans. Of transportation, which I hope is transformation <laughs> for America. I'm John Robert Smith, thanking you and signing off for the day. <laughs>